Annette always blesses us when she sings, and her mother, Miss Sue, is looking down from heaven today. I know she watched you as you sang because she loved to hear Annette sing, and, and we understand, and, uh, and it's a blessing to hear you sing that song. If you would, please take your Bibles and open them to Ephesians chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I'm going to ask Danny to put on the screen for us this uh, poem I've been getting us to read each week as a motto for our fight against the devil. So if you wouldn't, I tried to make the font a little bit bigger so you can read it better. Hopefully you can. I am a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Scripture is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the word are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I am a volunteer in this army. I am listed for eternity. I will not get out, sell out, be talked out or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier. All right, take your Bibles, as I said, and open to Ephesians 6, and we're going to read verse 13 and 17, the former part of verse 17. Next Sunday, I will take a break from this Armor of God series and preach an Easter sermon that the Lord has laid on my heart. But if you would look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And again, when is the evil day? Today. You say, well, I didn't have that on the calendar and didn't see that. No, no one told me. No, what that means is every single day is a day when we're in the battle against Satan. And having done all to stand, let's go to verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. May the Lord bless the reading of his word here this morning. Whether you are playing football, riding a motorcycle, working in construction, fighting a fire or fighting a combat, a person wears a helmet to protect his or her head from serious injury. And likewise, the Roman soldier did as well. He wore his helmet. And if you look on the screen behind me, you will see something that quite uh, resembled the helmet that he would wear. That helmet was made out of bronze. It was fashioned and shaped by a skillful craftsman. It uh, had sponge inside it to make it soft upon the head. It was very durable, and no knife or hammer could penetrate it. It had flaps on the side to protect the side of the face, and you also see that on the back was a neck guard, so if someone attacked the soldier from the back, he had protection on his neck. And also that funny looking thing on top, it's called a plume. That usually was uh, either bright colored or dyed feathers, but more so, most of the time, it was horse hair. The helmet was called a galea, and the, the, the plume on top was called a Christus. And it had horse hair, and they would dye it red, the color of the Roman army. And again, they wore red because red was the color of Mars, the, the god of war. And what was the purpose of the plume? Nothing except for the fact that those short men wore them to hopefully make themselves look taller. It was to intimidate the opposing soldier to give them an image that they were actually taller than they were. We seem to think that that seems uh, a little silly, but yet it's true. That's why they had the plume on top. Now, the Roman soldier would put on his uniform. He'd put on all of his gear. He'd put on 
his shoes, he would put on his belt, he would put on his breastplate, he would put on everything, and the very last thing that he put on would be the helmet. And once he put that helmet on, he was now ready to go out and fight. Now again, as I said before, the Apostle Paul, for probably up to three years, had been chained or was in the presence to a Roman guard. And during that time of his imprisonment, Paul saw many Roman soldiers. And he saw what they wore. And probably, I don't know, he possibly may have even inquired of them what each piece of the armor represented and met and was for. Now, with all that in mind, let us understand and remember that the Apostle Paul who was a thinking man, the Apostle Paul, who was a godly man, the Apostle Paul, who was a a called man, was thinking about all of these pieces of the armor, and the Lord led him to think in his mind how each one could represent a part of the spiritual armor that we need as we fight against the devil every day in the spiritual war of life. And so he's looking at that helmet, and he thinks, helmet of salvation. Now what in the world would Paul be thinking of a helmet of salvation? Let me tell you, the Roman soldier, let's let's do it this way, the Roman soldier would wear that helmet to protect from serious injury, and what kind of serious injury might he have or incur? Well, it'd simply be something like this. You have an opposing soldier wielding a sword at you, there's a very great likelihood that without a helmet, you're either going to have your face sliced open or perhaps even your head decapitated. So you can understand why he wore the helmet. And also any kind of injury to the head, which is the commanding center of the whole body. The brain is the command center. And the head is where the brain is. The brain receives all the signals by way of the senses, and then it tells all the other parts of the body how to respond and how to react. And if there's brain damage, there's very little that the body can do. It's dependent upon that brain and that command center. And so that, with that in mind, now follow with me, stay with me, hear me out. In the spiritual war against the devil, you know, the devil attacks us bodily, physically, we know that. But he also attacks us emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. In other words, translation, just to make it simple and easy, in this war against the devil, the devil will come after our mind. He will come after our mind, our way of thinking. He will try to attack the command center that uh, receives all the signals by way of the senses of sight and smell and hearing. And, and, he will, and then he will try to make us emotionally or spiritually or mentally wrecked. That's what the devil does. And one of the areas where the devil will attack us as Christians and try to warp us and confuse us, try to deceive us, and he lies. You ever hear the, the, the phrase, lie out of hell? Every lie the devil tells. By the way, John eight forty four says he's a liar and the father of it. And every lie he tells is literally, literally a lie from out of hell. The devil will lie in regards to our salvation. So Paul calls it a helmet of salvation. I'm going to share four such lies of the devil. By the way, when we are truly saved, when we have received Christ as our Savior and have been washed, cleansed, sanctified by the shed blood of the Lamb of God, then we receive that blessed assurance or inner tranquility that allows us to sing, it is well with my soul. It is that peace 
that we then have that, as Paul said, passes all understanding. But the devil will come after our mind and he'll try to tell us things in regards to our salvation that will confuse us and it ought not so to be. Let me tell you four such lies. First of all, the devil says that trusting in God is not enough to save us from hell. Trusting in God is not enough. Now, it says in 1 Timothy 4.10, it says that we trust in the living God who is the Savior for all men. All men, first of all, all men, all who receive Christ are the all men. But we trust in God who is the living Savior. Notice that living Savior, Paul wrote to Timothy. We cannot trust in any other God because they are not a living God. We can only trust in the living God and we'll celebrate his living next Sunday on Easter Sunday morning. But let's not just wait till then. Let's look at the fact right here and now that he is the living God. And so we trust in him as our Savior. That is exactly, that is precisely what the thief on the cross did when he said, Jesus, remember me when you go into your kingdom. Jesus looked over at him, and what did he say? Buddy, you got to hope they're going to let you down. You can get saved, but then you got to go to work because you got to earn your way to heaven. The devil will lie right out of hell and say that we have to gain merit points and live a life and work our way into heaven. We've got to go and knock on doors and pass out tracts. We've got to go. Now all of that is good. And doing work for God is good. Preaching for God is good. Playing an instrument for God is good. Or singing for God is good. Giving an offering for God is good. Serving a meal in church is good. Visiting the sick is all good. But it is just simply trusting in the Lord that gets us saved. And then once we truly are saved, we are to show our good works by how we live. But it all goes back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Paul said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, if we're going to believe the lie of the devil, that we've got to work our way into heaven, that we've got to gain merit points with God, and do deed after deed after deed, and ritual after ritual after ritual, to please God, so we then can go to heaven, then, if that's the case, then the, rich, the, I mean, the, the thief on the cross died and went to hell. And we cannot say that because Jesus looked over at him and did not say, buddy, you got to hope you get saved and they're going to let you down. No, he didn't say that. Instead, what did he say? He said, verily, verily, I send to you that today you shall be with me in paradise. Deathbed salvation experiences. I've seen them where someone may have cancer and they're dying or some other incurable disease and they're on a deathbed and within moments or hours before they die, they receive Christ as their Savior. I stood at the bedside of a man early on in my ministry, many years ago, almost 30 years ago, who received Christ as his Savior just a couple of hours before he died. His body was just eaten up with cancer. And he received Christ. Are you going to tell me he didn't go to heaven? Don't tell me that. Because the devil will lie to us and tell us that just simply trusting in God is not enough. Look, if you're here right now 
and you don't know Christ, or you're unsure of your salvation, then listen to me. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You who are longing to one day see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? It's grace. The devil will lie, and he'll tell us, no, you've got to earn your way there. Another lie of the devil is, he says that we can lose our salvation. Don't believe a word of it. Don't believe that lie of the devil. He says that we can lose our salvation. Come on now. He plays with our mind trying to persuade us that we can be saved one minute and lost the next. I remember a young man when I was in youth ministry a long, long time ago went, walked down the aisle one Sunday and got saved. About a week or two later, we went to a Christian concert at that time, remember, at the old Greenville Memorial Auditorium. And during the end of the concert, he got saved again. And then we had another service at church a week or two after that, and he walked down the aisle and again got saved. How many times you got to get saved? Think about this. You cannot lose that salvation. There is a, there is a, ser a serious issue, and the pastor at that time was dealing with him over that because he was struggling, and he's trying to search, he's trying to find. The point being, you cannot get saved and then lose it. If it is real in the heart. And that's very important that we know that. See, listen to me. God is not an insincere, hypocritical giver. He doesn't give us something and then change his mind. If we say that we can lose our salvation, then we are saying that we're limiting the power of God to hold us and we're limiting God's ability to know our hearts. Why would the devil want us to think that we can lose our salvation? Why would the devil want us to think we can lose it? I believe one reason why is because he does not want us to start over and start new and start getting into the Word and growing as a Christian. He wants to keep feeding our thoughts negatively that we're lost. So we are going around in circles here, stuck in this dilemma of how am I going to get saved? Will I get saved? When I get saved? He wants us to think that and prevent us from growing as a Christian. And also, when it comes to dying, he wants us to be scared. Are we scared to die? If we're scared to die, then something's wrong. We might be scared of the process of going through death, but dying should not be a fear of any of us. If we know the Savior... But he wants us to feel that way. He wants us to be scared of dying or scared of death. And that's one, another reason why I believe the devil wants us to think that we can lose our salvation. But I'll tell you that Jesus preached eternal security. He preached that we can be saved and once saved, always saved. He said it. He said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man come and pluck them out of my hand. There's another one. It is John 6, 37. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that come to me I will in no wise cast out. Now Paul put on the helmet of salvation and refuse to believe the lies of the devil that he could lose his salvation if it's real. And this thing about real or artificial salvation, I'll get more into it as we go on in this. But Paul was able to write to Timothy. In 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.12, he said, Paul said this, 
Paul said, for I know whom I have believed in. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You hear that? Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep, not lose, that which I've committed unto him against that day. Now, the devil wants us to believe we can lose our salvation, but God wants us to realize the devil is a flat-out liar. And we may ask the question then, well, what about, what about John or Jane Doe who at one time in a revival 32 years ago walked down the aisle and got down on their knees and invited Jesus into their heart and for a while it seemed as though they were on fire for God. They were singing in the choir. They were attending Sunday school. They were giving an offering. Then stand up and shout amen. Then all of a sudden they started phasing out. And you know now they had not been in the last 25 years except occasionally on Easter Sunday. We might get a couple of those or three next week. I don't know, but every church does. And they hadn't been as so long. What happened? It is quite obvious they must have lost their salvation. Here's the answer to that. Matthew 7, 23. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to stand before Jesus one day and he's going to tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's what we call artificial salvation. That's something that happens in the mind but not in the heart. And there have been a lot of people through the years who thought they were saved in reality were not because it didn't happen in the heart. And when it didn't happen in the heart, then there were not long-lasting permanent changes. And that explains the phasing out. A lot of people, Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You thought you were a Christian. And see, look, being a church member is not enough either. Uh-uh, having our name written on our church roll, that's a good thing. To be saying that we identify with this particular local body and we're going to work in that local body and we're going to support that local body. Having our name written down on the church roll, but that won't get us into heaven. Uh-uh. There's a lot of people that have been inactive, had not been in church in 20, 25, 30 years. Oh, I'm a member of this such and such church and when their obituary is written at the funeral homes, it'll be in there. We'll see, was a member of such and such church. And then many of us will say, well, I never knew who they were. The sad thing is God never knew them either. We need to put on that helmet of salvation and protect us from the mind-playing games that the devil does to try to twist us up and confuse us. The devil will also say, that we can be saved and then live how we want to live. Do whatever we want to do. And I'll tell you this, I'm afraid that a lot of people believe that lie. As long as I'm saved, as long as I'm a child of God, I can live how I want to live, I can go where I want to go, I can do what I want to do, I can think the way I want to think, I can say what I want to say, I can be whatever I want to be. And no one's going to tell me how to live. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to go to church and hear a preacher's sermon. I'm going to live how I want to live. If I want to say curse words, I'll say curse words. If I want to lie, I will lie. 
If I want to go and do immoral things, I'll, so be it, I'll do it. Because I'm, I'm heaven bound. I know that I'm saved. I know that once saved, always saved. There again, it is a lie from the devil who will tell us that, see, one lie he'll tell us, you can lose your salvation. Then, in another lie, he'll say, oh, you can be saved, but you can live how you want to live. Again, there again, it's from the head to the heart. Is it genuine? Is it real? Or is it artificial? Now, God expects you and I, his children, to live our lives in glory for him, to glorify him. The artificial believer, the one who has been artificially saved, not real, will have no change or no lasting change. But the truly saved will become a new person. A new person. The Bible calls it a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So that's the first thing we need to realize. When it really, really happens in the heart, and we're really saved, then we become a new person. New. Not new and improved, but new, new, new. Just a new person. Then, let me tell you, that a truly saved person not only will be new, but he or she will then live their life in a way that it emulates Christ and shines the light toward Christ for others to see him will be a living example. A person who's truly saved will live like a Christian, will live the Christian life. And it will be a, a long-lasting effect in their life. Galatians 5.16 says, We should walk in the Spirit, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we are to live the Christian life. And if we're truly saved, we will. Come on, someone, help me out here. I need help with this sermon. The fourth point I bring to your attention is this. And I got it, I've got a word wrong in my outline if you're following in the bulletin. I'll, I'll show you what that word is. The devil says... If God really saved us, not loved us, but you could say either, but I meant to put the word saved. If God really saved us, he would not allow bad things to happen to us. Oh, the devil tells us that all the time, doesn't he? That's one of the ways, I'm telling you something, that is one of the ways in which the devil can get into our mind and get us discouraged, get us depressed, get us defeated inside. He can get us down in the dumps for sure on that one. He can say, if God truly saved you and you really do belong to him and he really does love you, he would not let all this bad stuff happen to you in your life. Where? Tell me, come on, someone, please, I challenge you. Where in the Bible? Where in this blessed and earth and infallible divine book? Where? Where does it say, or where did God say, or Jesus' son say, that we will not have troubles and heartaches and pain in this life? In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus warned us and said we will have tribulation. He said that. But he said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. 
So, I mean, come on now. Think about this. The Apostle Paul, for example. Now, I know he was a bad guy at first. He was the persecutor of the church. I know that. His name was Saul then. Then he found Jesus on the road to Damascus. And you know what happened? He became that new person. Not new and improved, but new. He became a new creation. He was born again, cleansed by the shed blood of Christ. And then Paul, he began to serve God. Paul became the great missionary who then wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Some believe he might have even wrote Hebrews. If he did, that's 14. That's a third of all the New Testament books written by one man. Paul was this great missionary. Now you can say, well, he was Superman on earth when he was walking around. Paul was mighty. Paul was so God-fearing and so good as he expounded the scriptures and preached victoriously and powerfully everywhere he went. People were getting saved under Paul's ministry. We could call him Superman. I want to tell you something about Paul, though. As great as a man as he was in the ministry, Paul, boy, you talk about problems. He had them. Paul had what he called a thorn in the flesh, and he prayed for God to remove it. Prayed three times, and God said, No, Paul, I'm not going to remove it. He said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But uh, what kind of infirmities or problems did Paul have? You think we got problems? Do we have problems? Do we? We do. But listen to Paul's problems. He got sick one time. No one really knows what it was. The thorn in the flesh, but some think it was an eye disease. One time, his eye disease, and he did have an eye disease, his, his failing in his eyesight, and he had to have people to, he'd tell them what to write, and they would transcribe it as a secretary upon the parchment, upon the paper for him, and then the canon of scripture was put together later, but, but that's how he wrote his books, and he had to have a, a, a secretary to write for him because he could not see. One time his vision got so bad, his eye problem, uh, he had this stuff coming out of his eyes, and people said it was too grotesque to look at. It is believed that he also had malaria. It is believed that Paul also one time experienced Malta fever, which comes from drinking unpasteurized milk or, or eating uh, infected meat from animals and the meat not cooked all the way through. And he was deathly sick. Paul was beaten with rods, with a leather strap. He was stoned once or twice at least. Paul was thrown in prison, put in shackles. One time he was bitten by a snake and was in a shipwreck. When we get to heaven, we'll, we'll sit down with Paul under a shade tree and we'll talk about all the problems we had and then we'll look and Paul will tell us about all that he went through. So don't think that being a Christian does not mean we don't have problems. The devil will lie and make us think that. Billy Graham is one of the great men in our nation's history in preaching the gospel, the preacher of the 20th century. And he had Parkinson's disease in the latter years of his life. It crippled him. Even Jesus suffered. Even Jesus suffered. Yes, he did. Uh, and Isaiah 53, 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. But oh, there is coming a day because Jesus died on the cross that we're celebrating or remembering, I should say, this week. We'll celebrate his resurrection from the dead next Sunday morning. But he died for us on that cross. And because he did, there is coming a day as Revelation 21, 4 says, there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are washed away.
Paul said, and all the trial he'd gone through, Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings in this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So there's coming a day when we'll never suffer again. Now, let me, as I close, ask you this. Do you think that Paul was talking about the helmet of salvation as something magical? That we put it on us and we can get saved. We put the helmet on, now we're saved. No, no, no. I've already established that point. It's grace and mercy of Christ and simply trusting him. But the helmet of salvation, we put it on it to protect our minds because the devil, again, they attacks our minds and he's going to try to do everything he can to make us discouraged, troubled, sad. He'll attack the mind, the commanding mind center, which will then relay all info to the heart and cause us to get emotionally troubled. And that's how the devil works. He attacks the mind. So let's put on that helmet of salvation, knowing that we are children of God, we're saved, and because of that, the devil can pound and pound and pound and pound and pound upon our head or upon our mind, but as long as we're protected by the salvation and grace of God, we'll be okay. Come on, someone say amen. Let us pray.